Did you ever get frustrated, just confused as you were trying to make that transition out? Because I had prepared for my transition away from track and field when I was 20. But even though I had been preparing for it, when I came out of it, it was a whole new situation, right? Did you have any moments of frustration and confusion and even, honestly, some states of depression during that time? Completely. Um, I was extremely frustrated and dealing with a lot of things mentally and ruined a few relationships in my life because of it. Um, (laughs) But it was a very frustrating time because everyone's like, well, you've accomplished everything already. But I was like, well, I'm 22 (laughs) or 23, however old I was when I retired. And I was like, do do I just stop? Was that the end of my life right there? Is that all I will accomplish? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, So it was like, a lot of things like that. And they're like, well, you've already figured that out. So you'll figure out a new, a new status, a new uh, approach to things. And I was like, but how, how do I do it? And yeah. um, it just got very annoying hearing people say, like, I'll figure it out when I was as far away from figuring anything out as possible. over there right there <laughs> he makes appearances in all of zoom calls what's the what's what's the name of your cat she's annie oh that's kind of a big cat she's actually very small she's just very fluffy <laughs> and i may have just dropped her oh, sorry i thought cats landed on their feet <laughs> she kind of did but i meant to lay her on the back on the desk but it was a mixed decision apparently Kelly, well, thank you so much for coming on. It looks very, very sunny over there. I like the picture in the back. It is. Yeah. My New York picture. I love New York. But, um, so I kind of wanted to start here. I want to be respectful of your time. I know you have a lot going on right now. Um, but, you know, we can't really skimp over the past couple of years and the impact that has happened, right? The 2020 pandemic, and we're still dealing with it. But in the height of the pandemic, how did you navigate through it, right? Not just physically, but emotionally as well, too, because we're all still recovering from it in some capacity. Um, to be completely honest, it was really tough. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure what I actually did. Um, I started off living in Toronto uh, at the height of everything, and I was only just moved there, so I was only there for like about three months beforehand. Um so then I, everything just shut down and I was stuck in my home and I didn't really have any friends near me anyways. Mm-hmm. So um, it was a bit of an adjustment there. And I came to be with my family, like once everything started like shutting down more and more. So I stayed with my family in Edmonton for a month or so. And then I went back to Toronto to stay in my, stay in my apartment. <laughs> um, and ultimately I actually stepped away from everything physical for a while because I was dealing with a lot of transition issues out of skating and uh, COVID came at like the height of when everything was getting even worse. (laughs) So I decided I was just going to step away from it all. And uh, I was doing like Zoom classes and stuff with other skaters, but my own self, I tried to stay away from everything as possible. And then I went, I started school where it was all online. So I started journalism in school and then uh, ended up making a decision to move out of Toronto and come back to Edmonton. And I've been here in coaching and trying to put my life back together again. You know, it's, 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 it's one of those situations where like, you know, um, for you, you stepped away in 2019, right? That in itself is an adjustment, which goes to my next question. You're no longer on the ice every day, right? And I think being a part of athletes and and the profession that we're in i know for me i only went to three places right the track the weight room and anything else that i passed by was just extra extra and so you're around the same people um, that you see every single day you're traveling with them all these different things right but you said it was tough for you to transition i think athletes are kind of the only professions that you have to rediscover yourself twice 
So, Caitlin, when you were transitioning out, did you have any guidance between that, right? Like, how did you how did you navigate through that whole process, right? Because you're prepared for the ice, you're prepared for competition, but then you come away from all that, and it's like, yo, you're the same person, but you feel like you're just not. How did you how did you navigate through that whole situation? I know you said you're still trying to rebuild some things, but walk me through that transition. Uh, yeah, so I'm still trying to rebuild it four years from my last competition almost now, and I'm still trying to rebuild that. Um, but originally when I first decided I was going to be done, uh, I didn't know that was going to come in my brain. Mm. Uh, it was kind of a decision. I, I won my last competition and I was like, you know, I'm just not going to compete <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> I was like, I'm way too tired. I was like, I don't want to do this again. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so I really just ran away from pretty much all of it. Uh, thankfully, in skating, we have an opportunity to have a post career in skating where we can go on the professional side and travel doing shows and 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 teaching and all that fun stuff. Uh, so I jumped on that bandwagon really fast, especially like going off in the Olympic year. It, it's usually a lot more hyped up. Yeah. So I did that <laughs> for a year. I moved out of my home, moved to Ontario, um, really just ran away from everyone and everything that I knew. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I realized that might not have been the best decision because I didn't have anyone help guiding me. Yes. And I tried to figure it out by myself. And the more and more people kept telling me that it was normal and that they were going through similar things, it didn't feel like it. So Mm. I just kind of dug myself more and more into like a transition hole (laughs) for a few years. And it took up until pretty much COVID for me to actually decide like, no, we got to figure this out now. (laughs) Did you ever get frustrated, just confused as you were trying to make that transition out? Because I had prepared for my transition away from track and field when I was 20, right? I didn't want to do sports until I was in my thirties. I wanted to, you know, be out on my terms, But even though I had been preparing for it, when I came out of it, it was a whole new situation. And one of the things, as much as I appreciated what people were saying, they would always say, Akeem, you'll figure it out. Akeem, you'll figure it out. But I wasn't, yo, it was was hard. Like, I wasn't really figuring it out. And I actually got kind of annoyed of hearing that. Did you have any of that, right? Because sometimes, you know, when people transition or think they have their part figured out, but it's easier said than done sometimes, right? Did you have any moments of frustration and confusion and even, honestly, some states of depression during that time? Completely. Um, I was extremely frustrated and dealing with a lot of things mentally and ruined a few relationships in my life because of it. Um, (laughs) But it was a very frustrating time because everyone's like, well, you've accomplished everything already. But I was like, well, I'm 22 or 23, however old I was when I retired. And I was like, do do I just stop? Was that the end of my life right there? Is that all I will accomplish? Mm -hmm. Um, So it was like a lot of things like that. And they're like, well, you've already figured that out. So you'll figure out a new, a new status, a new uh, approach to things. And I was like, but how, how do I do it? And, um, it just got very annoying hearing people say, like, I'll figure it out when I was as far away from figuring anything out as possible. And it just felt like I was a continuous disappointment to everyone around me and that it was like an embarrassment that uh, one year I was on the top of the world and, and then I really wasn't. <laughs> Is there anything that you would change with the whole process, right? Would you have reached out to more people? Would you, you know, because in that moment, you know, you're so self, I mean, figure skating is such an isolated thing, right? You're with the team, absolutely. But when you're on the ice and, and you got the whole ice, you don't even got a corner, you got the whole ice, right? So it's a bit of an isolation process. And I think what we do in competition, we often bring that into real life and isolate ourselves. Would you do anything different? Um, yes, I definitely would have done things differently. Um, I probably wouldn't have gone an all in like running away from everything right away thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I definitely would have asked for help sooner. I was a strong advocate for mental health when I was, uh, when I was competing and getting uh, psychology help. And as soon as I retired, I shunned away from it all. And 
um, including my psychology. So I was like, why am I such a motivational speaker for this? And then not go. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and then like my body started changing because of, well, not training six hours a day. And I didn't know how to deal with that side of it. And I'm still learning how to deal with that side of it. So if I would go back, I would have definitely just not run away as fast as I did and definitely talk to more people and try to stay connected more with the people that I was traveling with um, in 2018, 2019, pretty much a lot of the, the, the figure skating team at that time had retired. Yes. Uh, we all kind of took like the same approach to things apparently <laughs> and decided to retire at the same time. Um, so I think I would have probably reached out to them more or trusted their opinions a lot more, but I had a hard time getting close to people uh, when I competed, let alone getting close to people when I was already struggling with my own uh, transition out. So um, it, it just became tough that way. So I definitely would have tried to stay connected more and have help. <laughs> you know, it's 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 funny, right? Because from the outside looking in, you know, people will say, yo, Kaylin, why did you retire at 22, 23 years old? But I don't think people understand that you've been doing this for such a long time and the years add up and then the injuries come in all of these different things right because from what i understand you've been skating since you were what three years old two years old two uh-huh how does that even work like what like how do, i couldn't i, I had couldn't a sister and i wanted to be like her ah so the older sister got you into it at two so when 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 you started doing it, you know, sometimes, you know, people say or I hear athletes say when I picked up the basketball or picked up the football or picked up the snowboard, I just knew this is what I wanted to do. Yes, you've seen your older sister do it. But when you started doing it, especially your first competition, when you were probably, what, three or four. Right. Did this feel like something that you wanted to do? Um, I was too young to know. <laughs> To be honest, I have no idea what my first thoughts of figure skating was. Um, The first time, it was just what I knew. Like, I came from a very small town, and my parents are both very athletic. So they wanted me and my siblings to be in sports. Mm -hmm. Uh, Regardless, they didn't care what it was, as long as we did a sport. Um, But coming from a town of that size, there was very few options. We probably could... In the winter, we could be a hockey player or a figure skater. And in the summer, we could be a swimmer and a soccer player. Mm. There was very few options. <laughs> um, so we went, we actually were put into figure skating to be hockey players. And then neither my sister and I switched <laughs> over. So they ended up with two figure skaters. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> but um, I never, it was just what I knew. I knew waking up, going to the rink, going to school, going back to the rink. And that's what I started in kindergarten. So it was just a routine that I got used to and I enjoyed it. So I wasn't going to argue about it, but apparently the first time that I ever thought like, you know what, skating's kind of fun. And for me was when I was 10 and I was already, I already went to my first national championships. I already won my first national championships. That's crazy. And uh, at a young level, they don't even have that level at nationals anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I had the choice to switch into ballet because I was living in Montreal, taking ballet to help my skating. And um, I was offered to go full time into ballet, but my parents told me that I could only choose one or the other. And immediately I chose skating without even questioning it. So I guess that was my point where I knew skating was for me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in in as the time progressed, right, um, 2011, 2013, as I was doing my research, it's kind of when you started to, you know, win some medals, get on the national championship and the international stages. You know, what what was your mindset going in? Like, were you nervous? Did you did you feel pressure or was it just another competition? The first few events that I did internationally, um, I they felt like another competition i was around athletes that i never thought i was ever going to be at their level um i watched the 2010 olympics and only 2010 olympics was like the first olympics that i actually watched (laughs) and um mainly because i knew some of the athletes competing so i was like okay i'm gonna watch you guys and i was watching the women's event and i was like yeah this is a level that i'm i'm never gonna be at this level Mm. so it never even became like a dream of mine to go because i just automatically assumed i wasn't good enough 
Um, and then fast forward like three years, uh, <laughs> I was competing with these skaters that I was watching in 2010. And I was laughing. I was like, I don't belong here. So I was like, I'll just compete and have fun and see what happens. And then I started winning things. And then I went to my first Olympics and I was like, and it just all happened so fast that I didn't have time to like think about it and get nervous or like, yeah. why is the, like, what is happening until after my first Olympics? And I was like, all right, cool. So apparently I am good enough. <laughs> you know, it was funny, right? I remember, I remember one of my first competitions. Now it, not one of my first, but I think, I think there are moments in our careers in anybody's career where you have this moment where you say, you know what, I belong here. Like, I feel like I can really do something here. And for me, I didn't, I didn't do well this race. I think I got like fourth or fifth, but I was in the race with some of the people who I used to see on TV, right? Was there a moment maybe in competition or going into a competition, Caitlin, where you were just like, wait a minute, hey, my program was right. Like I was on point today. I think I can actually get a medal here and do well because, you know, 2014, you got a medal, right? Was there any time prior to that where you said, you know what, I think I can literally be one of the best in the sport you know i never had that mentality where i could that i belonged somewhere until 2017 um so that was wow. a good few years after my first yeah. olympic so um, even when you got the medal you've been to the first olympics it was never like yo i can be one of the best it was just like i'm yo i'm here i'm just enjoying it uh yeah i went there i went to 2014 fully for experience um i wasn't ranked high in the international standings um in my own individual event i didn't skate the absolute greatest i came 13th and that's kind of where like i thought i belonged was like the 13th rank um so i just kind of like admitted it and i was like yeah okay that's cool but like two weeks prior to that or a week prior to that i did get a medal at olympics yeah. um <laughs> in the team event but i knew i was on such a strong team and that was the first time that figure skating had a team event at the olympics so it was still very like confusing on what it actually was and how it worked. Um, and for a long time, I felt so guilty about that medal because I knew I, well, at the time I realized now I actually did contribute to getting that medal, but for a good few years, I did not see it that way. And I felt very guilty that I was a part of that team and they kind of like pulled me up to get a medal. Mm. Um, <laughs> So it took me a good few years to realize like, okay, no, I did help there. And then in 2018, I really made sure I helped to get that gold medal yeah. um, so that I, it took a bit of that guilt away. <laughs> you know, you know, when you were watching your first Olympics, right? It's different watching it and then getting there. And then the feeling may be the same, or it may not be exactly anything that you planned it to. When you got there your first time, right, what, what, what was going through your head? Did it live up to the expectation that you may have created? Or was it just like, man, this is normal. <laughs> it's, I'm here to work. <laughs> uh, that one, I felt very normal. Actually, I felt a little bit like for the first Olympics, like, it, my first Olympic experience like puts a lot of people's first Olympic experience like kind of, I don't know. People always seem so excited and I'm just like, I don't get it. Um, and then I went to my second one. I get it. Yes, that is exactly <laughs> but, how I felt. <laughs> but the first one I walked in and like the other athletes, some of the athletes near me were like crying, like unbelief that they were there and like bubbling with excitement and energy. And I'm just standing there and I was like waiting to feel it. And it never came. And I was like, I don't like what? <laughs> and then I never made it to either of my opening ceremonies because I was competing, but I did make it to the closing ceremonies. And in 2014, I walked in on closing. Well, I didn't actually walk in. I walked in on people's shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and that was the first time like I got it. I was like, this is what everyone's like hyped up and excited about. And um, it was just unfortunate that it was the closing ceremonies of my first Olympic Games that it yeah. took that long for yeah. me to figure it out. Um, but yeah, so that's when I felt it. <laughs> you know, before we get to the 2018 where, you know, you came away with two medals, right? <laughs> I read where there was a part in 2014 where, you know, you, you broke your leg, you needed surgery, and that whole process made you want to consider retirement, right? Now, a lot of people who may not be in the sporting aspect or put themselves in that mindset, you may think to your, they may be thinking to themselves, oh, 
get the surgery. It's easy. You'll be right back to where you left off. And don't get me wrong. That all sounds good, right? It makes for a greater story and it does make for a greater story, but you have to put yourself back together, not physically. Physically, the surgery, you can put the, the rods in and the bones will hopefully heal properly if the surgeon does their thing, because I, I've seen some surgeons that didn't do their thing, Caitlin, but the surgeons do their thing. But then you have to mentally rewire yourself to be able to trust that your body is going to hold up. Caitlin, during that time when you were considering retirement, what was going through your head from a mental standpoint, right? Because I'm sure there were some dark moments, man. <laughs> Funny enough, my ankle break, like it did require surgery and stuff, but like I've talked to my doctor after this and she's like, you got so lucky with that break because it only broke a bone. It didn't affect any ligaments. Um, I had to get, I did have to get the surgery and then I had to get a second surgery to get the metal taken out. Um, But it healed, everything healed as good as it could heal. Um, So my bones did what they were supposed to do to heal. Unfortunately, uh, that mental aspect was what tore me down quite a bit. And I didn't realize actually how much it tore me down until a few years later. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I was dealing with a lot of injuries up to that point. I had tore my hamstring. I had a stress fracture on my foot the year before. Right after I healed from that, I tore my hamstring. I was out for a couple more weeks. Um, Finally got back into skating and got another stress fracture on my foot. And I was like, I was so frustrated. I was awake training in California and I had to come home early. And I called my mom. I was like, if I ever get injured again, I'm done. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I'm so tired of being injured. Um, Because it is a learning curve every single time you get injured, whether it's a small injury or a big injury, like you have to take so many steps back to build forward again. And uh, (laughs) literally the day before I was allowed to start training like full time again, after the the foot stress fracture, um, I broke my foot, my leg. Um, <laughs> getting stressed but, here, Kayla. <laughs> 10 minutes after I was already supposed to be off the ice from training because I decided to stay on longer that day. Put in that extra work. Yeah. Do the um, right things. <laughs> and I wasn't even doing anything special. I wasn't jumping. I wasn't spinning. I was literally skating and learning new choreography. And I broke my foot doing the simplest thing possible on the ice. <laughs> um, and I remember the first thing ever when I first hit the ice was just like, cannot believe this is happening again. And that's all I kept screaming in my head was that I cannot believe this is happening again. I didn't know that it was broken, but I knew there was something just not right at all. And the sounds were inhuman. And like, yes, I was in a lot of pain, but I think a lot of that pain came from just me being absolutely broken myself and just exhausted and um, just in disbelief that again, it was happening and I was embarrassed and all this stuff. So I sat in the hospital and I was like, I'm never stepping foot on the ice again. Like, and that commitment in my brain was there. And, uh, I didn't tell anyone other than my mom that I wasn't stepping on the ice again. And, and I was too scared to tell people because that's all people knew me as was as a skater. So, and I thought that it was going to be the easy way out because it would have been, I easily could have walked away. Um, and a part of me just felt guilty walking away on something easy. Mm. Um, so I think that's what kept me going for a little bit, but the mentality that I had about just, I was never doing this again. It took me a good two years to break that out of my head. When you got back on the ice, Caitlin, because I remember, man, like, I, you know, I tore my hamstring and I tore my quad. And when I came back to my first competition, right. I yo, I ran very bad. I ran so slow. And I was like, yo, I'm washed. I was like, yo, I'm washed. I'm never going to be back to where I was. All right. So how did you pick yourselves up? And, and, and what was those next competitions like? Because it, it didn't just happen overnight. I'm sure there was some periods where you may not have gotten the score that you wanted or some jumps, even going up to do what may seem second nature to you and questioning, man, if I come down, am I, am I going to come all the way down? Or am I going to be able to land it? Was there something that you had to tell yourself to rewire your brain or was it just repetitions over and over again in training? Um, I was doing the training. I was doing everything I could in training and I was actually skating um, minus one year. One year was really bad. Um, (laughs) And then the next year I started competing um, and 
in practice, I was doing what I had to do. Um, I was showing up every day. I was putting in the hours, putting in the repetition and skating actually really well for what I knew I could skate as at that time. Um, and then I would go to competitions and I got nervous for the first time in my life. I was uncomfortable on the ice for the first time in my life. My like favorite thing to do at competitions was to like make judges feel uncomfortable. I don't know why, um, but that was like my How would goal. you do that? How would you do that? Um, just doing my job, doing my skating. But like I could do like weird things with my legs when I was younger that would like I always loved when I did it in front of a judge and the judge would look at me like, what did she just do? Mm-hmm. Um, or like uncomfortable eye contact because it's actually what we're supposed to do. But it's really funny when you actually like catch a judge's eye and you don't look away. I don't know why I get really, I have a really fun time doing that. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't do that anymore. So like everything that I was comfortable and like knew about myself on the ice was completely different when I came back after my injury and I didn't know how to deal with that. And I came out, won my first competition internationally. And I was like, Oh, well, this is going to be a breeze. Um, it was not my next competition. <laughs> I fell on everything, like everything. I landed two things in my short program and then just fell until the rest of my event was over. <laughs> Long program included. I missed everything. And I got off the ice in like absolute shock. And my coach is like, are you okay? And I was like, you know, I think so. (laughs) I don't know. Ask me in a day. (laughs) Yes. And it was just that continuously after another where I would like improve a little bit, but not really get to anywhere where I was. Um, I wasn't meddling at anything. I went to national championships just kind of assuming I was going to make it to the world championships uh, because that is what I'd done in the past. And it didn't happen. I came third and only Chuck two went and I was third. And by like the smallest margin, I didn't get to go. And it took then when I came back, I had to like go to the next competition right away. And I did a lot better there. And I came out of that competition. I was like, you know what? I'm exhausted. I'm like, Mm. that year sucked. Like it was absolutely horrible. It was not fun. I don't like going to competitions, not being happy at the end. Um, (laughs) I get it. Mm -hmm. The training is my least favorite part of skating. Like it was not my favorite. I loved going to competitions. I knew I had to do the training, but it was my least favorite. So I was like, am I really going to just torture myself for the next two years? I'm like, am I just done? I'm like, is this just proof that I can't get back myself back? And I was like, you know what? No, I'm like, I'm two years out from the next Olympics. I'm like, I'm not going to end like an 18 or 19 year career at that point on two horrible years. Um, So I was like, you know what? I'm going to like do whatever I can and make it better for the next two years. And the only thing I changed was going to a sports psychologist. (laughs) Mm. Right. Other than that, my training was the same. My Like the hours I spent was the same. What I did on the ice was the same. Actually, we cut back one hour on Wednesdays. So I actually went back one hour (laughs) on my last year. Hour rest. A hour rest is needed. Hour rest. Um, And I think just that mentality of just you being like, you know what? I have two years to put in all this effort. It was, it wasn't that I had to change anything. It was just that I had to change my mentality to make it worth it. And have a purpose when I showed up to the rank every day or showed up to the gym instead of just showing up because people told me to. Because I'm a firm believer that um, the moments that break you or almost broke you is the moments that make you who you are, right? What did you learn during that time about yourself, right? Because a lot of people, I think sometimes we can so, so focus so much more on their chaos and their turmoil that we actually miss the silver lining in that moment, which is usually the discovery of our strength, who we are away from the sport. Cause listen, when you're hurt, Hey, Hey, nobody can, Hey, you an afterthought, you know, but what did you learn about yourself? Right. Kaylin, the person during that time. Uh, <laughs> the tough one. Um, I learned I was a lot more resilient than I thought I was. Um, I thought things just happened to me. Mm. <laughs> a really bad way of saying that. Um, <laughs> But like my whole life, I just 
did my job. I showed up, I put in the hours and then I competed and it went well. Um, and that's kind of how my life went. And like I said, about 2014, I felt so undeserving of a silver medal because I didn't think I belonged there. Um, I belonged in like the 13th to 15th rank. <laughs> that's what my mentality was. And when I got injured and had to put in the hours, like I was spending four hours a day at physio, just trying to relearn how to walk and get my muscle back and my confidence back as quickly as possible. Um, or just having to keep myself busy when I wasn't allowed to do what I knew what I was allowed to do every day. <laughs> um, it taught me that I had, I did work a lot more than I thought I did. Yeah, I did yeah. show up every day and put in the hours and um, it just taught me that I was a lot stronger and, and yeah, a lot stronger than I thought I was. And that I had a capability to do something that I never thought I could. Oh man. And, and, and did you ever moving forward, but you know, it's all of these things that, 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 that are transferable, right? All of the things that we go through, especially in sport and anything that we do, we can transfer to a different season. But during that time, Kaylin, the noise is a little bit calmed down because listen, physio rooms are boring as heck, right? There's no, there is nobody clapping for you. There is no lights. Uh, what was the support like for you during that time, right? Like, you know, yes, your parents are there and they can do a lot, but you also need other voices out there as well too. During that time, um, what was the support like for you and how did you stay encouraged to go to physio? Because that's a whole battle by itself, just going to physio. You know, how, how, how did you stay encouraged, you know, each and every single day? Because some days are tougher than others. Definitely some days were tougher than others, but I had such amazing people around me at that time um, that I wish I embraced that kind of support more when I retired, but I did not. So <laughs> when I broke my leg, I embraced all support I could get. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, but my parents were super supportive for one. Uh, they were cooking for me because I couldn't. Um, cooking when you can only hobble around on one foot, I discovered it's really difficult. I'm very proud of myself when I mastered scrambled eggs after. Hey, like, small home. wins, small <laughs> wins. They add up. They add up. But um, like for me to be able to go, I was at the gym a week later because all my trainers and coaches knew that if I stepped away for too long, I wasn't going to come back. Um, so a week post my surgery, still on my crutches, hobbling around, uh, my trainer convinced me to come in and just do what I could. And unfortunately my dad was working. I couldn't drive cause I decided to break my driving foot. Um, <laughs> so I couldn't do anything. And so I would have to go to the gym at four 30 in the morning. Cause it's the only time I could get a ride to the gym to work with my trainer. And my dad will be up and in the car waiting for me so I could, so he could drive me there and hang out and wait for the hour for me to get done and go home. Mm -hmm. And then, so my parents were like amazingly supportive that way. My trainers did everything they could to help motivate me. If I showed up and just wanted to cry for an hour, they let me show up and cry. For an hey, hour. Shout out to them. Shout out to them. <laughs> They're like, you know what? <laughs> Sorry, my dog's going nuts. It's all good. <laughs> So yeah, uh, it was just amazing like what they did for me there. They tried to keep me motivated by just keeping me strong. And then my physio, I started working with him when I was 13 years old and we made physio fun. Um, instead of just doing the fun ankle exercises that I could do. And then that was just really exciting because like the smallest movement was like the world's best thing. Um, and it just really made me appreciate the simple things. <laughs> mm. Because it's amazing how excited someone can get by pointing and toe. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, and then we started making obstacle courses to build like my confidence and like my instability. And we just made it fun that way. And that was a big game changer for me was to keep everything fun and light. Um, even my agent was like booking me for like random events that I could just go to. So that I'm not sitting at home. Yeah. Uh, my friends would come pick me up and, we'd go shopping for the day or something to just keep me out of the house and up on my feet. And that was a big, big help. And 
next thing I know, the seven weeks or whatever were over and I could get back on the ice. You know, I think it's important, right? Because as much as we think we can do everything alone, no person is an island. All right. So, you know, now that we've built that foundation, right, of all of the things that happened prior to 2018, special year for you, right? And I actually watched um, your program about three times this morning. And I was watching it, Caitlin. And, and, and from what I see, right, at the beginning, you were kind of feeling things out. But then you started to get confident. Right. And then everything started to become different. I was like, to me, now I'm still learning how everything is being judged and the right scores. But for me, I'm seeing someone who was coming in, who was getting warmer and warmer and more confident and more confident. And I got to midway. I was just like, oh, yeah, she's on the podium. Right. And I and I was because that's just a confidence thing. When you were on the ice, Caitlin, getting ready right? Because some of the judges were saying, you know, there's so much pressure on the line, like you don't already know that, right? But what did that moment feel like? And did you feel like you were going to win a medal at that time? Um, Actually, what you saw was very accurate. (laughs) I'm glad Um, I'm close. (laughs) And I had never been more nervous in my life as I was that morning. Mm. Like I'm normally a very chatty person and my, like my roommates that were at Olympics, like she tried to, some of them tried to say like, good morning to me. And I would like say good morning, but she could tell like, I was not Didn't there. Talk. Yeah. There was no like emotion behind it. It was just like monotone. No one talked to me kind of mo- morning. Um, and then like my coach, he was trying to talk to me and he's like, all right, she's not going to talk today. Cool. Cool. <laughs> this is new. <laughs> That's just uh, with it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, well, she just looks like she needs more water. I'll go get that for her instead. <laughs> um, and I was getting on the ice and we have to wait behind this curtain because the, the skater's on the ice. And I was like behind the curtain, you could hear everything that was going in the stadium, but you couldn't see anything because you're just looking at a purple curtain. And I was like, oh, what am I doing? I'm like, I, I was so scared. I was like, I'm going to go out and just like miss everything. Like it's not going to work. Yeah. And then we had a six minute warm up, and the six minute warm up is what like changed a lot of that nervous system in me. Um, was because like I got on the ice and I was expecting to miss things. Like I would go up into the air and I'd be spinning and I'd be like, all right, I'm, I'm not going to land this solidly. And then I would land and my leg was so still. And I was like, okay, we'll take it. <laughs> and each jump, they like gained my confidence. And then I had to wait a while and I was skating after the girl who ended up winning the Olympics and she has a tendency to put out really high scores at that time. And I was like, full committed to hearing a world record going out before I skated. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm ready. And funny enough, like people like tend to click, like there's a lot of skaters that will like plug their ears for the noises. I've never been one of those people. I was like, if I hear it, I hear it. I don't, I don't, I didn't hear it. I heard cheering, but I somehow missed an entire score being announced. And I was like, all right, I guess it's my turn. And uh, I went into my starting position and each jump I landed, I, w- I shocked myself by how solid I was. Wow. And um, I got landed the first jump. I was great. The second jump, the third jump, I had a little wobble and I was like, oh no. Or like, this is it. I'm like, this, this is not going to work. And yeah. then the next jump is usually the one that I miss. Like this thing was like my Achilles heel. Like I hated it so much because it was like, it half the time worked majority of the time it didn't. And <laughs> I was going into it and I was like, Nope, not today. We are doing this. Mm-hmm. And I landed it. I felt like this weird sharp pain on my foot. And I was like, we may have just broke my foot, but whatever. <laughs> not today. Not today. <laughs> and when I hit the ground, I was like, you know what? I'm on my foot. And then it was just like smooth sailing. It like gave me so much more energy for the rest of my program. And, uh, the only time I got nervous then was going into my last jump because it was my easiest. And because it was my easiest, I tended to miss it. Um, <laughs> because I'd be like, oh, this is easy. Yeah. Fall. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I went in and uh, I landed it. And then I just got to celebrate for the rest of my program and then do like the things that I loved about skating, which was like the performance and storytelling. 
And I really got to just like live that moment. And um, yeah, when I finished my program, I didn't know if I hit the podium or not. I knew I was in contention because I was in third after the short. Um, but at the same time, like there's a side of me that just knew something was mm-hmm. good was going to happen. <laughs> and I, for me, it was such a big confidence boost because like I said, in 2014, I felt very undeserving and guilty. And when I hit the ending position of that program, I was like, no, this is why I'm here. And it was kind of just like my screw you to everyone who never thought that I was going to get it done. <laughs> Kaylin, I want to, I want to ask you a question that, that, you know, I, I didn't really tell myself when I was in the sport because you're, when you're in it, I mean, even now it's something I'm still working on, but when you think about what you've been doing and you are way more than an athlete, absolutely. But when you think about how much time you've put into it, to the injury that you had to come back from and all of the traveling and all of the things. And then you finally come away with an individual medal as well as a team medal. Was there, did you ever say, Hey, like I'm proud of myself, right? I'm talking about self-worth now, right? Did you ever take a moment to say, man, I am proud of me. It took a minute (laughs) because it took a long time for me to get over the mentality that I could always be better. (laughs) Mm. And it happened for like a split second at Olympics and then a split second again at the world championships a month later. Um, So my whole life, it was always like, you could be one. I wasn't the greatest jumper growing up. And then I ended up being a really good jumper, but it was always like, I could learn how to jump better. I could learn how to spin better. My choreography could be better. I could stretch my legs more. I could be more graceful. I could be leaner. I could be skinnier. I could be everything to make myself better. Um, (laughs) And then I just always thought that I was never actually going to be good because I could always be better. Mm. Um, And when I hit my ending position at, at the Olympics, it was my moment to just sit there and I was like, no, I am good enough. I just did that. And I did the same thing at a world championships a month later. I was exhausted. Competing a month after the Olympics is a very horrible idea. I agree. Um, <laughs> I agree. It was like three weeks of me crying at home <laughs> and <laughs> going to the uh, going to world championships and just being like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then I was in fourth after my short. I was just like, this isn't working. I'm like, I'm not skating great. Like, what are we doing? Um, And then I went into my long program and I skated a program far beyond. I skated a clean program, like potentially almost better than I did at at Olympic Games a month before. And that's when I didn't even care what everyone thought, because at that moment, I knew I was good enough for everything that I thought I could do. Mm. So the Olympics was kind of like, my to everyone i'm good and then my world championship was to me i was like we know what we did this i'm like we both woke up this morning thinking i was going to quit halfway through this program and i made it through and i won so (laughs) um it was it was just an exciting moment that way uh last two questions before the last fun five caitlin but we got to touch on stars on the ice right because not everybody gets an opportunity to do that right and I was watching some of your programs there as well, too. It almost kind of seemed like you were skating like a lot freer. You know what I'm saying? Like there wasn't really any like, yo, there's a medal awarded here. It was just, yo, I'm just here for fun. I'm just here to just do my thing and enjoy this moment. What was that? What was that experience like for you? The Stars on Ice and any other show that I've been a part of, it, it is just free. It's the reason that a lot of skaters start skating to get on the ice and just have fun. It's the reason why in the middle of winter you see a bunch of people out skating on the outdoor rinks. Um, it's just the feeling of having fun on ice. If Well, if you can skate. <laughs> um, some people that don't know how to skate don't really feel the love of ice. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but it's just free. And in skating, there's just so many rules. There's so many things to follow. There's so many judges to, to impress. And on a day, some judge might just not like you. And I've just come to terms with that. Um, <laughs> where is, I just admitted defeat sometimes at competitions. Cause I was like, you know what? I skated great today, but apparently they missed something. This is a, um, this is a real thing. It's a, it's, that's a whole another hour. We could touch on that. 
It's a whole thing. Um, so I just, towards the end of my skating career, I just stopped caring why the judges thought. I was like, you know, I'll do my job. If it works, it works. It doesn't, it doesn't. Okay, whatever. Um, but I come to at shows, I didn't have to worry about that. There was no rules. I didn't have to do these big triples that I hated doing. Um, I could just do what I wanted <laughs> mm -hmm. and have fun with the audience and joke around with the audience and actually like talk to them during a program sometimes, which was always a little interesting. They didn't expect it. Um, but it's like feeling that interaction with an audience a lot like closer and, and feeling that interaction with the other castmates that I have and the people that I've traveled the world with. And um, it's just a lot more intimate and free. <laughs> You're two years removed from it now in 2019. Um, I've, what, what are your thoughts on it now? Right. Cause sometimes when you're, you're done with it, like you're done with it, you don't watch it. You don't do none of that, whatever animosity you may have to certain judges or certain things or certain people, you just don't mess with it right now. But what is that relationship with figure skating like now for you? It's like an ebb and flow. I get it. I, I get it. Trust me. I get it. <laughs> Um, I very much distanced myself. I didn't watch skating for almost two years. Um, and then I just gotten back into watching it and COVID happened and there was no skating to watch anymore. So I was like, I'm just not meant to watch skating anymore. It's a sign. Um, <laughs> but and now I actually find like an enjoyment watching it and a really uh, sigh of relief actually watching it that I'm not competing because in the last four years, I don't know what happened to figure skaters, but they like really increased their abilities. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm watching them and I was like, Oh, thank God. I'm not <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really fun to watch it now. And I really, and I love that side of it. Um, I've gotten into coaching, which originally when I retired from skating, I said I was never going to do because it's just something I never wanted to do. I was like, I was so frustrated with so much about skating. I was like, I don't think any kid wants me to teach them that. Um, <laughs> so uh, I kind of vanished from that side of it too. And then I got convinced to just do it sometimes. And I actually started building like an appreciation for it again. And now I love going to the ring to coach and um, working with kids. And even it's just the smallest thing, like learning how to straighten a leg on a spin. Um, I get like bubbly excited. So that side of it is like, I'm growing to love uh, my skating itself. I'm still trying to train for shows. I actually have a show coming up soon. Um, and then the stars on ice tours in the fall, in the spring again, hopefully <laughs> they keep wanting to postpone that. Um, <laughs> let, let it happen. People let it happen. <laughs> um, so I'm still training like for things myself and, and that's where the, the ebb and flow really comes along. Uh, some days I show up and it's fun and it's free and other days I just question why I'm trying to do this to myself again um, I'm definitely not as good as I was four years ago. So like the realization of that every day kind of like beats at my ego quite a bit. <laughs> um, and everyone's like, well, it's fine. That was four years ago. Your body changes. I'm like, yeah, but it's still gonna mess with my brain a little bit. Yeah. Especially <laughs> when you've been at that level, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, you don't have to be perfect to be, to be at that better than average level. You know, Kaylin, I can tell that you're a person who is going through a bunch of changes and transformed into the person that you are today, more confident, um, able to speak your mind a lot more. But there's still things, as you said, that you're dealing with, right? The changing of the body and so many different things. And I think that's something that a lot of people deal with. You don't have to be in sport to deal with body changes and mental changes. Kaylin, if there was one word of advice, maybe someone's listening to this and they're going through their own trials and tribulations. Maybe they're a young female skater or a male skater who is trying to get there. When they're on the ice, they're cool. But when they get off the ice, they're questioning, is this really worth it? You know, am I strong enough? Am I lean enough? Am I slender enough? What is a word of encouragement? What is something that you would say to someone who may be battling their own mental struggles? Um, can I give two words? Give two. <laughs> Come on now, Kaylin. Give um, one, to us. <laughs> one is passion. Um, nothing's worth it if you're not passionate about it, in my opinion. Um, you can hate it. <laughs> you can really not like it some days. But 
there's still a reason that people show up. And if you stop losing, if you start not having that reason, whether some days it's for your coach, you show up for your coach. Some days you show up just because you want to get out of the house. Um, some days you show up because you're actually excited to go. Like there isn't good days. Um, <laughs> so having that reason, having a passion and just revisiting what that passion is and what it is that drives you. And then like deciding from there um, to either take a step back and revisit that passion in a different direction or continue with it and push through and get back to the parts that make you excited. Um, for me, it was the performance and the competing. I love competing. I love performing. I hate a training. Uh- <laughs> I get that. I get that. So oh, I knew I had to show up because if I went to a competition and wanted to be happy at the end, if I didn't train, it wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. So uh, define that passion and the reason that you do things, but then also just be kind. Um, and that's something that I've learned as I got older and retired from skating was to be kind to yourself and to be kind to others that are trying to do the same thing. Um, everyone's dealing with their own struggles in different ways. And unfortunately, there's a lot of the world that just isn't kind anymore. And that can tear apart that passion quite a bit. Um, that's been a big part of my struggles with returning back to skating, especially during COVID, uh, where I wasn't really able to train for a year, um, was just the unkind people that kind of made me forget why I love skating or why I love doing my job sometimes. So to be kind to others, (laughs) but also be kind to yourself and realize, um, what you're doing, you're doing it for a reason. You know, that's, 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 that's so powerful. You know, I always say, you know, someone's always going to say something regardless of what you do. You may be the first person to fix world hunger and someone would say, well, why did you do it like that? You could have saved money over here. So to me, it's just like, man, exactly what you said. Be kind and give yourself some grace. But Kaylin, let's jump into the, the last fun five questions. We got the hard stuff out the way, all of that stuff. Now we're going to get into the easy fight. Well, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be too hard. But uh, first question, if you were trapped on a deserted island for a week, Kaylin, you could only bring three things. What three things would you bring? I'm a dog. Okay, okay. <laughs> if I'm going to be on an island, I need my dog to be able to swim with me. <laughs> um, my dogs, um, a good book. And I feel like survival kit. <laughs> hey, you need a little band aids just in case. You need, you need, you need some. I'm, I'm a klutz. I need a survival kit. <laughs> Question two: If 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 you could have dinner with five people, past or present, Caitlin, who would be at your table? Oh my gosh, I don't need to get no five people. Um. Or know five people's names. <laughs> uh, I want to say Barbara Ann Scott because she is an amazing figure skater that I wish I actually got the opportunity to meet. And her magazine is always above my head when I work. So mm. I love it. Um, Tom Holland, because I love Spider-Man. And those are two very extreme separate things going on. Um, <laughs> really, any Marvel character, I would love to meet them. Um, like Brian Reynolds. Like, I'm not going to complain about that. Um, <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I need two more and I can't think of them. I'm sorry. Okay. It'll come. It'll come. come. You know, three, uh, question three, you know, there's so much perceptions of you, right? They see you on the ice, they may see you in person and they may have their own perception about you. What is one of the biggest misconceptions about Caitlin Osmond? Um, (laughs) that it. I don't know. Um, I'm a lot more open about who I am now, but when I competed, everyone had a strong sense that I was, well, extremely confident and I was not. (laughs) I was very, very not confident and uh, a lot of misconception over just me being comfortable with who I was and just, I guess that came from my performing side, but I was not. I was never comfortable. I was never confident. It, it, it was a lot of fake until you make it things going on when I competed. 
question for um i know you're doing journalism now what 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 should we expect from you in that category you're respecting articles or respecting some media stuff what which area of journalism do you want to go in uh great question it changes by the day that's okay. um, <laughs> time we got time <laughs> I love the media side of things. I love uh, my biggest dream growing up was radio. I don't know why, mm. um, but I love radio. Just to talk about literally anything I want <laughs> or anything the radio station wants. Um, <laughs> but the more I got into journalism, I started writing articles around psychology and stuff like that. And I really, really loved it. So who knows? <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Kellen, last question. You know, everything that you've had to get through to get to this point, right? On the ice, off the ice, the ups and downs, all the traveling, everything that got you to this point. If there was one word to describe you, what would that one word be? And give me a little context behind why that word. Uh, uh, great question. <laughs> I know, not supposed to be hard, right? I know, I know. <laughs> I thought these were easy questions. Um, resilient mm. um, it's a word that I need to remind myself of every day also um, but a lot of people help, used it to describe me when I competed because I did have to deal with the injuries and uh, I had a lot of upsets and a lot of benefits in skating and I was resilient in it and a lot of people keep trying to tell me that now and it's harder for me to feel that and remember it uh so i'm gonna keep that word because i have to keep reminding myself of it yes i'm, I'm a firm believer that sometimes you gotta tell yourself something over and over and over again until your heart starts to believe it not necessarily your mind but your heart starts to believe it. Kaylin, thank you so much for your time. I know you have a lot going on in these next couple months and now, but where can people continue to support and to keep in touch with what you're doing? Because Stars on the Ice is hey, it's coming, it's coming back. There's not going to be no delays. We're going to see you back on the ice very shortly. Yes, Stars on Ice is coming up soon, hopefully, 99% sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Still trying to work on getting more things. If you're a skating club, I love being hired for seminars. Just saying. Hook it up. Hook it up. Um, <laughs> and my Instagram. My Instagram is probably where you'll see me the most, which is at Kate Kiss. So. Kim, thank you again so much for your time. Um, we'll be in touch. Have a great rest of your day and week. You too. Thank you.